anything we're talking about here on the afternoons program. But at 21 minutes to three here on 5AA, Pauline Hanson, Senator for One Nation, joins me in the studio. Good afternoon, Pauline Hanson. Good afternoon, Stacey. Thank Thank you you. for your time. My pleasure. Lovely to visit you again. I, I, I was just saying, look, I've been in, coming in the studios, I think, since 1996, 97. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Different, different face behind the microphone this time. Uh, <laughs> it makes no difference, but it's great to be able to, to connect with the people of South Australia and they can hear directly from me. Yeah. Well, we do appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing in Adelaide at the moment? Well, actually, I'm here to support the party, actually, to catch up with Sarah Game. She's our upper house candidate in, mm. in the parliament and doing a fantastic job. And uh, to we have, we've we got a huge big speaking engagement tonight. I think there's over 500 people yeah. that's turning up tonight at the convention centre. So Malcolm Roberts, Senator Malcolm Roberts is here with me as well and Sarah Game tonight. So it's connecting with the people and I think you have to communicate with the people so they know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And in that communication, do you have much uh, um, that you want to talk to your supporters in South Australia Australia about the One Nation Party in SA. Obviously, Sarah Game uh, was elected uh, two years ago in the state election. Do you have any? What do you? What do you think? How do you think she's been look, going? And look, what I'm hearing, she's doing fantastically. And actually, I'm not going to say any names, but it's <laughs> quite interesting with the Liberal Party. They're saying she's doing a fantastic job, and this is a member of the Liberal Party in saying she has actually shown up the libs for how incompetent they are in this state and actually the policies and the, and the platforms and private members' bills that she's putting up mm. is actually in the best interest of the people of this state. You need a competition. Look, you'll only get good government if you have got good opposition mm-hmm. and that's what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. So when they're both aligned on their policies, you need someone else who's in the crossbench or the small party or one nation that is actually going to start questioning them. And then, you know, then you're going to get good government. Mm. She's voted um, with the government on certain bills and with the opposition on certain bills and then, as you say, introduced her own um, private members' bills as well. So I think for a lot of people it was... Unexpected is not the right word because we didn't know what to expect from a One Nation MP in South Australia's parliament and we didn't hear a whole lot from Sarah Game before the election. So I guess it's all it's all new territory. But if, you, but if you watch One Nation on the floor of parliament, we actually look at the legislation. It's not because I'm a conservative at heart. It's what's the best for the, for the country, for the people. Mm. And that's why we vote. It's not about aligning yourself with the Labor, the Greens or the, or the Coalition. We are independent free thinkers. That's why I structured the party. That if you're going to, like I said again, you, you can't just say, be a yes person because this party's putting it up. You have to look at the legislation. Is it right for the state? Is it right for the people? And we've taken that same stance and all my members of parliament do it that way. Look at the legislation. Mm. What about the future of One Nation in South Australia? Obviously, we have a a state election in two years' time. Do you plan on running um, another candidate in the next state election as well and then potentially having two in the upper house of state parliament? We are going to stand on a number of candidates. We're going to um, fill every lower house seat and we're going to give people the opportunity. As I said to people... Every seat? Yes, every seat. In the lower house, plus also the upper house. And as I say to people, you know, you're out there screaming, you're fed up with the way the system is, the politicians don't listen to you, you're not happy with the way the state's going or the country's going, so I'm giving you the opportunity to actually make a difference. It's not me, it's you, the people. You're the voters. You decide. You actually say, are you happy with the status quo, the way it's going, or do you really want a difference? What is the difference with us giving us a go? If you're not happy with what we're doing for you, then don't vote for us at the next election. But you'll never know that unless you actually give a vote for One Nation. And that's what the people last election, they did that with Sarah Game. You know that our polling now has shown us 13% support in this state because people are happy with what she's doing. She's not beheld to anyone. She is an individual who is actually representing her state. She doesn't hear from me. I don't tell her what to do. I was going to say, does she call you when she's reading state, state policies and say, oh, Pauline, no, what, how would you vote no. on this? What do you want me to do on this? No. 
No, and I tell all my state members that. I don't live in your state. How can I advise you on something, unless it's a universal issue, that I might discuss a couple of things with her. Mm -hmm. But um, one thing I will be raising with her in South Australia is that I've heard that local governments, you don't have to be a resident of the state or permanent resident to actually vote in your local government elections. Mm. And you've got foreign students here that are actually, um, they're actually uh, they're getting eligible their, to vote. That's right, mm -hmm. and it's wrong. That's wrong. That's a state issue. I'll be raising that with her. You've got to have people who are permanents in the state that live here, invest in the state, not foreign students that have a right to vote in your, in your council elections that are going to determine your future. I think it's wrong. I, I can't believe it when I heard it. The argument against that is that they're living in the suburbs or the city, we have a high proportion of international students living in the city. So let's use the CBD as the example, yep. that they're living in the city. So the policies that the Adelaide City Council, for example, would be implementing affect their everyday lives. So the other uh, the other side of that, people would say, Sorry. well, they should get a vote on the policies that are going to affect them. They're not paying the rates and taxes as, as they do with everyone else. They might actually rent an accommodation or something like that. The whole fact is they have not got a future investment in this in this, um, in their council area, you know. So why give them the vote? I, I've never, I never heard anything like it before in my Isn't life. Is it like this in other states? No. Oh, that's interesting. And okay. then it's only, it's compulsory. It's non-compulsory for them to vote as well. So therefore, you're actually in a small electorate when you haven't got many people at all. You can actually control the vote. Mm. So you can you can harness those votes and go on. Um, collect them, and that's not representative of what the community wants to um, vote on. Mm. I think it's ridiculous. Mm. All right. Well, I'll have to uh, keep an eye on that. I'll have to touch base with Sarah Game and see if she's going to introduce any legislation to change to that. I'm talk with her about it, but okay. I'll be raising it with her. Oh, well, you've heard it here first, Sarah Game. Expect <laughs> the call. No, you're probably in touch with her regularly. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good working relationship, yeah. and I have, I'm very proud of her and the job that she's done. And she's taken to it and she's a hard worker, very hard worker. Mm. But the people of South Australia are the ones that are benefiting from that. Mm. It is 14 minutes to three here on 5AA. We'll continue to get Pauline Hanson's thoughts after this. And I do want to ask her about her thoughts on the federal budget that was announced earlier this week, the future made in Australia policy that the Prime Minister's announced. And I also want to ask her about Peter Dutton's plan to reduce the migration intake of Australia. So that's coming up. Ten minutes to three here on 5AA. Pauline Hanson, One Nation Senator, joins me in the studio this afternoon. Senator, thank you for hanging around. Thanks, Senator. Before the break, we were talking about, um, well, you were talking about the policy in SA that international students can vote in local council elections. Yes. And that's something you'd like your um, state MP, Sarah Game, to look at. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I think it should come under... The, uh, it, I presume it should come under the state legislation. Yeah, yeah. So, the you know, local government do, act, yeah, I think right, it would local, be. Yeah. That's right. So um, I think she needs to, to look at it because if you've got international uh, students here, you know, what skin in the game do they have? They're only here for a year or two and doing their their degree, whereas council elections are held and you've got councils there for four years plus. Mm. So therefore, any decisions that are made is going to take it beyond their time being here. So if they haven't grown up here, they don't have any connection or to, to the area, why just because they're here and they utilise services that you're going to give them a vote? That's that's not right. I don't believe it. Why don't, then? Why don't you open it up to all international tourists or anyone that's coming here that may be in the country or pack packers and all the rest of it to have a vote in your state elections? I guess some people would be hoping they would stay here. They would become permanent residents. They study here, then they can work here, then they can pay taxes here, and then no, well, let. Let's get them their citizenship and really they have skin in the game to have a vote in it. I've so never... it would be citizenship that would be the threshold for you for, then, for them to be. then be able and to that's vote? the same with any election in, in Queensland. You have to be on the electoral roll mm. to actually then vote in council elections, state elections, and and you are compulsory to vote in those council elections. I think Queensland is a model that a lot of South Australians would like to see, especially when it comes to the number of councils. We always talk here about the number of councils we have. I think we have... 60-something councils in SA, and I know there's one council for Brisbane. Brisbane it's big, City, It's a big yes. Brisbane yeah, City is, Council. Yes, it is. 67 councils we yeah. have in SA. Yeah. It's huge. 
Well, it is huge. You know, <laughs> if you're going to people run your areas, then let them have some skin in the game, be be part of it, feel part of the community. Mm. Uh, so anyway. Jason has given us a call on 8223 0000. Jason's in Salisbury East. Hey, Jason. Hey, ladies. How's it going? Good. Good, thanks, Jason. Pauline, I've heard you a couple of years ago mention something that kind of surprised me about how foreign students can buy property freehold here while they're here doing their studies. Has that changed? You're just going to try and change No, it that? hasn't. It's, it's still the same. Foreign students can buy property here, and it's either new build or established. See, under the, under the Act, only foreign investment should be on new properties, not established. But foreign students can buy established property. But under the rules, they're supposed to sell it prior to leaving the country when they're going to leave the country, but it's not policed. So no one checks that? No. So they're allowed to buy a house as long as they sell it when they leave, but then... Foreign Investment Review Board are pathetic, absolutely pathetic, and they don't follow up a lot of things. There's only about half a dozen people that work in it, and uh, a lot of these people are buying um, established housing, not entitled to buy it. So until we actually address the housing problem in Australia by stopping foreign investment and students... Um, owning the properties. See, their parents send them out here, they buy the property, they go back to their country and the, and they have their established property here in Australia. Well, there you go, Jason. Thanks. No Thank problem. You. Thanks for the call. 8223 0000. You touched on it there, housing and the number of migration, the intake, the migration intake figure. Yep. That was addressed by Peter Dutton this morning in his uh, budget reply. He wants to reduce the number of migrants coming into Australia. He wants to reduce it down to 140,000. This coming financial year, it's going to be 185,000. Is that enough? 140,000, we we usually have about 130,000 that actually leave the country every year around about those numbers. And I've always been for net immigration. Okay, so the number of people that leave the country, bring that many back into the country until we can actually uh, address the the services, the congestion on our roads, the um, the housing. Uh, housing is a big problem. Mm. At the moment, we've got about 650,000 houses that we are short for the people that have in the country. Let me just say, okay, the government says that we need to bring people in for the worker, you know, workers in the nation. Now, in between 22 and 23, we have 737,000 people that came in as new migrants. Of that, 51,605 were actually skilled migrants. Of that, only 1,800 were in the building industry. That's all we had. So a lot of the people we were bringing in were general managers, hairdressers, people, skills that we don't need. So we're not bringing in the people that we need. They might not have been builders, but they may have been nurses, Tradies. teachers, no, no, no. No, IT workers. We need nurses and teachers. Of course we need that. But why don't we go back and address the, the nurses and the teachers that lost their jobs because of COVID and still can't get employment? We had trained people in those areas, but because the bureaucracy and our governments and state and federal that actually denied them the right to work because they didn't have the jab. But would it have been ten thousands? You know, thousands. It of was them? thousands. It was. It was thousands of people that lost their jobs. Now those those people have moved on with their lives. We've lost all that skill, and for what? You know, these people denied their right to work to provide for their families. And that's why I was so annoyed about the, you know, forced to get the COVID jab at the time. But it is what it is at the moment. Yeah. So we've actually, I'd be advertising for these people, giving, give them some incentive, get back into the workforce again. Do you know we've still got um, firefighters in New South Wales and Victoria still denied the right to work because they didn't have the jab back then, that time? Mm. And yet they've stopped the uh, the jab, um, the ones that are now that had the jab then, they don't have to have it anymore. So there's this there's this attitude we're going to keep punishing you, and it's so wrong. You know this is you know we should be standing up and supporting our Australian people there that went through a lot of problems. Faye in Windsor Gardens has given us a call eight double two three double o double o. Hi Faye. Yes, good afternoon, girls. I won't keep you, but I just wanted to say about this uh, this business about uh, Peter Dutton and his plan for cutting back on uh, immigration. Mm. Yes, it is difficult. Um, it would be hard to know how many pe- people we need to come in and so on. But I, I don't agree with 
what he he's trying to do because we've had many people that are being out of work and I think they need to go back to the drawing board to see, you know, I think they need to think again um, because people are, are trying to work and can't get jobs and all the rest of it and we need people like your medical in, in the medical fields and all the rest of it. Um, I'm sorry, but girls, but I don't agree with, with the cutback. Uh, no need to be sorry, Faye. You're allowed your opinion. Yeah. Faye, um, I've got no problem with bringing in people that we need in these trades, whether it be um, health, whether it be... Um, Managers, even people, they can't find the skilled migrants, engineers, whatever. Um, we have to bring in people from other countries p- to pick the fruit for our fruit growers, the abattoirs, all yes. the rest of it. Mm. We actually need these people by all means. Because we, we record right. low unemployment at the moment. Our, our unemployment oh, rate I, is so low. People, anyone who wants Stacey, to work probably has a job. Stacey, one hour's paid work a week doesn't classify you as unemployed. We've got nearly 900,000 people that are claiming to be unemployed in Australia Mm. on welfare. A lot of these people are full-time unemployed people who don't want to work. And it's not the taxpayer's responsibility to give them a way of life. No, you know, yeah. I believe in looking after people who actually need that help and assistance for the health yep. reasons or whatever, but you do not give them this attitude that they can be on it for 10, 20, 30 years, unemployment. Mm. That is not the way it is. No. You give mm. them a helping hand when they need it, and that's what I'm saying. Two years out of five, you will get welfare and assistance from the from the taxpayer, but you will not be a lifetime on welfare without putting some effort Effort in to getting a job. All right. No, exactly. Faye, thank you for the call. You there you go. Yeah, you disagreed time. in the beginning, but we found agreement in the end. There you yeah. go. That's Faye it's, in it's Windsor finding Gardens. The, it's finding the balance, Stacey. All right? And that's what we have to do. And um, the trouble is that through the educational system, a lot of kids coming out of there, they can't read or write. We're pushing them in. We say we mothball kids too much in the educational system. Everyone's a winner. Well, sorry, you're not a winner. (laughs) Real life is not you're all winners. And so until we change the attitude that we have in the educational system, we're actually the woke identity, gender dysphoria, all this other rubbish that's going on. Get back to the basics of teaching our kids how to read and write the three R's, rewrite and arithmetic, mm. to provide, to, to prepare them for the future when they hit the work. You yeah, know? yep. Unfortunately, it's three o'clock, which means it's time for the news. We've run out of time. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the future made in Australia policy and, and your future plans oh, in SA. I'm but sorry. I know yeah. that's all right. I appreciate you coming in um, and and sharing with us your, your plans. See, I'm say. always available by phone, all right? Sounds so I good. I can always have a talk with you in the future. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Stacey. Pauline Hanson, One Nation Senator.